tried to hold it with a piece of paper, white balance. <coughs> Today I want to talk about the three empires that are covered in this chapter, even though what the Persians had was certainly not an empire. We call it an empire out of courtesy. They simply had a country. Um, those three empires are uh, all uh, Muslim in the sense that <coughs> the uh, populations are primarily, um, uh, let's say the ruling elements of the populations are Muslim, even though uh, the Indian and the Ottoman state are multi-ethnic and multi-religious. Uh, but because of the sort of image that Islam has in world history, we sort of stress the idea that these are the, <coughs> the, media, the late medieval or the early modern uh, Muslim empires. Uh, the period that we're talking about, let's say 1500 down to 1700 or so, is the heyday of the uh, European notion of the divine right of kings. Uh, and it is a period of a greatly diminished notion of the divine right of Muslim rulers. Uh, Europe is more intensely religious during this period than the Islamic world in terms of the way in which the, um, uh, the structures of their states are conceived. <clears throat> we don't tend to recognize this because since Europe moves in a direction of secularism after the French Revolution, we tend to um, see the religious phase of Europe as something that is about to pass away and uh, we by contrast, and to exaggerate the religious dimension of the Muslim states. When I say that the Muslim states were less religious, uh, I'm talking about what I see, although perhaps no one else yet sees, uh, as a uh, profound change in the character of Islamic uh, political structure that begins uh, before this time, shortly before, and comes to a, uh, to a fruition in this period. Uh, the period of transition is from, let us say, somewhere around 1175 down to oh, 1300 or so. Uh, and it, um, it coincides with and to some degree is directly involved with uh, the disappearance of the caliphate. Uh, in Islam, <coughs> a political institution called the caliphate is uh, uh, said to have come into being uh, the day after the death of the prophet Muhammad uh, when a friend of his was acclaimed by the community mourning the loss of its prophet uh, as the Khalifa, as the Caliph, uh, a word that means successor. Uh, initially it may have meant um, a successor to God. Um, uh, eventually it came to be thought uh, of as a successor to the messenger of God. Uh, doesn't make a whole lot of difference, and in fact, uh, the story we have about how the caliphate originated may have been an invention of later uh, chroniclers. We don't have to, uh, to think about this, but I think the one thing that's fairly clear is that the, uh, the caliphate was focused on uh, defending and extending the realm of Islam. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, manifesting the, uh, the, the Muslim character 
uh, of the state. <clears throat> there were different theories as to what uh, warranted someone claiming the title of caliph. And essentially you have three theories. Uh, one theory maintained that the, that the caliph or um, a word that is sometimes synonymous, the imam, uh, that the caliph or imam should be a member of the family of Muhammad descended from his first cousin Ali. Uh, the reason it should be this person was variously explained by different uh, schools of Muslim thinkers. Some people said that it was a matter of uh, sort of uh, dynastic legitimacy, that uh, Muhammad uh, should be succeeded by this cousin who was also uh, the father of Muhammad's uh, grandchildren uh, because he married Muhammad's daughter. His name was Fatima. Uh, some people said that it isn't a matter of blood descent of this sort, but rather a matter of a divine ordination by which God has identified uh, the person who should be the leader of the Muslim community. And the signs of that identification are uh, diverse depending on your school of thought. Some people said this identification uh, took the form of uh, designating that whichever member of the family of Ali fought for rule and achieved it <clears throat> was therefore the imam because uh, God had helped him achieve dominion. Uh, other people said, no, the, the imam is to be determined by the uh, explicit designation of the current imam who picks one of his sons uh, to succeed him. Um, so you have different ideas, but all of the ideas that look upon a member of the family of Ali as by some definition of divine right being the imam, uh, we call all of those Shiite. Uh, and it is, in fact, the defining character of Shiism. <coughs> Shiites are people who believe that the leadership of the Muslim community <coughs> is divinely ordained to be uh, uh, in the family of Ali. The uh, other end of the spectrum, that is to say, instead of having divine designation, the other end of the, end of the spectrum was the idea <coughs> that some, some people see as sort of proto-democratic, <coughs> that the most pious person of the community should be the imam. And it was sort of a uh, purist sort of concept. And these people are called the Herodites. So you have uh, Shiism, <coughs> uh, Herodism, and then the third form is Sundism. Well, the Shiites today are dominant in Iran. They're the majority population in Iraq. Bahrain, possibly in uh, Lebanon. They are a very substantial minority uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And among the Muslim community in India, they are a, uh, a very substantial uh, group. The Harajites today have virtually disappeared. They uh, continue in their contemporary form only in the Sultanate of Oman. So all the rest of the Muslims are Sunnis. I put it this way because the word Sunni uh, doesn't really have a very explicit definition in the early centuries of Islam. <clears throat> it is kind of a residual category. Those people who are not Herodites, those people who are not Shiites, are ipso facto uh, Sunnis. 
And what defined being a Sunni uh, was it became sort of uh, elusive. Uh, the word comes from uh, Sunnah, which means tradition. And it means specifically the tradition of the community or the tradition of the prophet. There's another word for tradition that means specifically the words and deeds of the prophet Muhammad as handed down and collected in certain uh, canonical uh, works almost of the same importance as the Quran. And that word for tradition is hadith. So I want clearly to distinguish between the word sunnah, which is a uh, the behavior of, of a community and uh, that we translate as tradition and the, <coughs> the word hadith, which means a specific prophetic tradition. Books on sunnah uh, will cover all sorts of things uh, from uh, theology down to day-to-day um, uh, -day, uh, practice. Uh, I recall reading one translation into English a few years ago that had a section where it said, the sunnah of hair is that a man must shave his upper lip, he must shave his head, he must shave his pubic hair, and must shave the hair on the palms of his hands. And I thought, I, I don't have any hair on the palms of my hands. And in fact, if I did, I think it would be demonic. <clears throat> and I would end up on the sci-fi channel in some fashion. Um, so I asked the translator whether possibly what it really meant was shave the hair in the armpits. And she said, well, but the word was the palm of the hand. And I thought it was worth at least a footnote. But you know, the notion of sunnah um, goes all the way from this sort of thing like uh, how do you drink water, how do you urinate, how do you uh, maintain the palms of your hands. Um, goes all the way from that to questions of how the caliph is chosen. And in the Sunni notion, the caliph is conceptually an elective office. Um, but the notion of election pretty much subsided after the first two or three caliphs and was supplanted by a two-step process of nomination and oath of allegiance. So that typically the current caliph <coughs> would designate his successor. And then there would be an oath of allegiance uh, by the population called a baya. And that oath of allegiance would confirm the, uh, the caliph uh, in, in power. In the early days in Mecca, Medina, the oath of allegiance was taken collectively by uh, the entire population. And we have a great deal written about certain people who would uh, raise objections to the elevation of someone to the caliphate by refusing to take the ayah, but the bayah, refusing to swear the oath, oath of allegiance. But by the, um, uh, the late 700s, um, it had become customary for the, uh, for the chief judge or some other religious dignitary to take the oath of allegiance on behalf of the population. Uh, so essentially, you had a caliph who had come to power, probably because his father designated him. And then he would designate a son. And, the, and when the caliph died, the son would be confirmed in power by the bayah sworn by the chief judge, uh, possibly with some other dignitaries, on behalf of the population. In other words, something that was conceptually elective and uh, dependent upon the consent of the governed in some respects, had deteriorated into simply a dynastic, uh, dynastic success, succession. Nevertheless, if you were the caliph, 
uh, you were entitled to certain uh, regalia, certain signs of rule <coughs> that then get mentioned in history books as indicators of who is ruling. For example, once you are the caliph, you get to put your name on the coinage. And frequently, this is how we know who is ruling at a certain point. You look at the coins from, from that mint, and you find out whose name is on the coinage. Uh, it also means that during the, the sermon that takes place during the noon prayer on Friday, uh, when there are prayers for the ruler, uh, the caliph will be uh, mentioned by name. And uh, these two items of regalia uh, were important public indicators of who the caliph was. You would think people would know who the caliph is, but uh, you know, it's good to remind people. Um, Mayhew's study of the London poor in the early 19th century revealed that a very substantial percentage of the poor people of London did not know who the king was. Some of them didn't know they had a king. <clears throat> so uh, you can't assume that everybody knows who the caliph is. Um, you also got to have, have the caliph's name written on uh, ceremonial garments that were handed out to appointees to office uh, to show that they were uh, under the patronage of that particular uh, ruler. So you have quarrels among Herodites, Shiites, and Sunnis about who should be the caliph or who should be the imam. Different theories, different struggles. And when someone seizes power, as would happen from place to place and time to time, uh, they would frequently try to legitimize their power by getting a letter or a proclamation from the caliph who would say, you are now my legitimate appointee. So you, the word sultan, which is used at this time, uh, the time of this chapter for the Ottoman ruler, uh, is a word meaning power, and it originally meant the temporal, worldly power of the caliph. And what happens is that the notion of the worldly power of the caliph becomes separated from the, from the religious authority of the caliph. So you have a sultan who says, I am acting on behalf of the caliph. But in order to do that, he had to have the, uh, the authorization of the caliph. So um, you might have someone who conquers a province on some frontier of Islam. And he would write a letter to the caliph, say, I have conquered, uh, say, uh, Kashmir. Uh, and I would like to, to be recognized by, have my conquest recognized by you. And the caliph would write back and say, I received your letter. I hereby recognize you as the governor of Kashmir. On my behalf, I confer upon you the title of such and such. And I am sending you a, uh, a horse as a gift and a robe of honor that will have my name on it uh, on condition that you mint coinage with my name on it, and that at the Friday prayers, uh, when prayers are, blessings are summoned upon the rulers, your name is mentioned after my name. So it's a very formal kind of thing, but it was terribly important uh, because it was the essence of what made uh, a legitimate Muslim ruler rather than simply a warlord. Now, there were plenty of warlords around. We tend not to hear much about them in the Chronicles because they don't rise to the level of gaining this sort of authorization. But if you read sort of fine-grained studies, you find that um, there are lots of people who are trying to seize power in a particular area. But the notion of having the authority of the caliph as the touchstone <coughs> uh, was always there and, of course, um, conditioned upon the definition of what constituted a caliph, whether it was a Shiite definition or a Harajite <coughs> definition or a Sunni definition. And sometimes you could have more than one caliph uh, being defined in different ways. Uh, after 969, for 202, uh, 202 years, you had a caliph in Cairo who was a Shiite and a caliph in Baghdad who was a Sunni. So. Um, 
for that earlier period, those earlier centuries of Islam, you can talk about <coughs> the, uh, the underlying political theory is the theory of <coughs> caliphate or imamate, and people uh, struggle uh, for this sort of credential. Now, that disappears in large part um, after the year 1200. So that during this period of the Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal empires, while the rulers are Muslims and they are powerful and they use a title like Sultan or Shahan Shah, King of Kings in Persian, um, their relationship to the ultimate uh, legitimating authority of Islam uh, has become quite different. To me, this change is uh, best indicated by uh, an event that shows up in every world history textbook, but I think has not been sufficiently identified in its importance. And this event took place in 1187. And it was the uh, reconquest of Jerusalem by the Muslim general Saladin, or Salahadin. Uh, the Crusaders had captured Jerusalem during the First Crusade that began in 1098. And uh, they held Jerusalem uh, for um, uh, almost 100 years. And then Saladin led the, uh, uh, the Muslim armies of uh, Egypt and Syria uh, against the Crusaders and reconquered the city. Saladin uh, was Kurdish, which uh, in normal definitions of the caliphate, that is say in the Shiite and the Sunni definitions of the caliphate, uh, disqualified him for being caliph. Though uh, among the Herejis, if they had still been around, and there were very few left by that time, he could have been the caliph. The Herejis always said that the best of the community is the imam of the community, even if, it, if he is a black slave. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, the Sunnis had traditions uh, that maintained that the caliph must be an Arab. And many of them specified must be an Arab from the same tribe as Muhammad, the tribe of Quraysh. Uh, among the Shiites, they said that the caliph or the imam must be a descendant of Ali, Muhammad's uh, son-in-law and first cousin which of course also would make him a member of that tribe. So here you have a man like um, Saladin, uh, a Kurd, uh, in a period when most of the powerful people from Afghanistan across to Egypt, uh, most of the, of, the, of the generals who really held power uh, were not Arabs. They were either Kurds or Turks. Uh, more Turks than Kurds. Uh, sometimes they were Armenians. Uh, there were some important Armenian converts to Islam who played significant roles. <coughs> but in the case of Saladin, he is a Kurd. He sends a letter to the caliph in Baghdad after taking Jerusalem, saying, uh, my valiant troops have retaken the holy city of Jerusalem. And the caliph writes back and said, uh, actually, those are the valiant troops of the caliph who have retaken Jerusalem. And Saladin writes back and says, no, they're my troops. They've retaken Jerusalem. Because the caliph really hadn't lifted a finger uh, against the crusaders uh, over the preceding period of close to a century. Because the caliph didn't have any power to speak of. He just had legitimating authority. Uh, later that year, at the end of the year, uh, Saladin picked one of his top military commanders to lead the pilgrimage to Mecca. And a caravan went to Mecca, as it would do every year, under the command of this 
individual. And of course, at the same time, a caravan set out from Baghdad with an emir uh, appointed by the caliph to lead the caravan on the pilgrimage to Mecca. So the two caravans, plus caravans from other places, uh, Yemen and so on, arrive and they are camped out in one of the pilgrimage <coughs> sites located outside of Mecca. And on the day when they are supposed to go into Mecca, the head of the Syrian caravan says, okay, uh, uh, play the drums, let's get going, we're going into Mecca now. And the head of the Iraqi caravan said, actually, I go first. And you don't come with your caravan until my caravan has gone first. And the Syrian says, there is actually no authority that says that you go first. And I'm ready to go, so play the drums. So a battle broke out. Uh, people were killed. You had uh, professional soldiers plus uh, the various uh, pilgrims themselves from Iraq and Syria fighting it out. And um, uh, in the process of the battle, the Syrian uh, uh, emir uh, is mortally wounded. So they take him to the tent of the Iraqi emir. The Iraqi emir says, you know, this really wasn't the time and place for us to get into this dispute. So let's just kind of forget about it. But then the Syrian emir died. Uh, it is fairly clear to me, uh, uh, this episode, I've never seen a translation of it. It shows up in a, in a major chronicle, but nobody's ever paid much attention to it. But it seems to me that this epitomizes what is happening at this point, which is that Saladin is claiming greater authority than the caliph. And yet he has no claim to being the imam of the community. He's not an Arab. He is uh, not the holder of any position uh, granted by the caliph. But he has taken the holy city of Jerusalem. Uh, a few years later, I can't remember the exact date, it's around uh, 1204, something like that, uh, an inscription uh, has been found, that is to say the date of the inscription dates to a few years after this event. And uh, in the inscription, Saladin is identified as, uh, on the one hand, uh, the master of the Haram al-Sharif, that is to say the Muslim shrine in Jerusalem. And on the other hand, he's identified as uh, Haram al-Haramain, which means the servitor of the two holy places, meaning Mecca and Medina. So the inscription is basically saying that Saladin now controls the three holy cities of Islam. Whether they had ever been brought together as a threesome before this, I don't know. But they clearly show up as a threesome now. That Saladin had recaptured Jerusalem and he was claiming authority uh, over Mecca and Medina. And uh, he was using a title uh, servitor of the two holy places. Uh, Hadam, which means servant, uh, and Al Haramain, uh, which means the, it's a dual it's of the two harems, uh, the, the two sacred places. So now Saladin not only is claiming this, uh, this authority, uh, or rather I should say he is uh, claiming a certain functional priority. Uh, the, the caliph may have used the term Khadim al-Haramain before this. I have not seen it, but uh, I was reported to me by someone that there is a text in which the caliph uses it. But this is the first time it shows up as sort of a freestanding title. And it's an interesting title. Uh, first, 
because it, um, it is separate from the issue of uh, divine legitimation. It is simply saying, de facto, I hold the power to be the authority over the holy cities of Islam. Uh, but secondly, and perhaps more importantly, this title of Khadim al-Haramain persists from that time, from roughly 1200 down to the present day, as a significant functional title for whoever controls Mecca and Medina. Um, it is a shift from authority based upon divine legit uh, legitimation, whether of a hereditary sort or of an elective sort, to an authority based upon uh, functioning in a certain role with respect to the Muslim community, uh, but without a divine appointment to do so. In 1258, the last caliph in Baghdad is killed by the Mongols. Uh, there are a couple of people over the following year or so who claim the title of caliph uh, because the position is now empty. Uh, uh, one ruler in Tunisia, uh, one in Yemen. But the fact of the matter is there, there is no, uh, there's no real um, mechanism for deciding after that who will be the, um, who will be the caliph. Then Turkish generals who are in power in Egypt, who have seized power in Egypt from the descendants of Saladin, uh, they find a relative of the last caliph. They put him on a throne in Cairo, and they call him the caliph. And nobody pays any attention to him. Uh, so you have what's sometimes called the shadow caliphate that lasts until the Ottoman conquest of 1517. Uh, the Turkish generals who are ruling in Cairo, uh, in other words, create a legitimizing authority that is totally under their control, but they also continue to retain a title that is not given to the caliph, but is reserved to themselves, which is Khadim al Haramain, the servitor of the two holy places. Because starting with Saladin and his descendants and continuing under the Turkish military rulers in Egypt and Syria, uh, the idea that you serve Islam and legitimize your rule by, um, by guaranteeing uh, the function of Islam, uh, in particular in the form of the pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina, and you defend the Muslim community against enemies, whether those enemies are crusaders who are still around uh, in 1250 when, uh, or 1260 when the caliph is set up in Cairo, or whether you are defending um, the, caliph, the Muslim community against the pagan Mongols or the non-Muslim Mongols who have invaded and killed the caliph in Baghdad, uh, you have a dual function of the ruler, which is to protect the Muslim community uh, and to facilitate its, um, uh, its carrying out of the ritual functions of Islam. And in this period, in the uh, 1400s, 1400s, 1500s, 1500s, you have a kind of acceleration of uh, a strong ritualization of Islam as a day-to-day -day, uh, practical uh, religion. But the issue over who is the legitimate uh, ruler, that is say in divine terms, the question over whom God wishes to have in charge of the community, that becomes largely moot. Uh, the Arabs are pretty much done. You don't have Arabs ruling, uh, in, except in rather remote areas, particularly in southern Arabia. Um, you have Turks, you have Kurds, you have Iranians, none of whom are, have the bloodlines that would uh, warrant they're being considered uh, imams or caliphs. Uh, so 
to a large degree, the later period of Islam is uh, experienced within a political theory that is quite different from the medieval one, and one in which the ruler is functioning as a protector of Islam or a guardian of Islam and a facilitator or guarantor <coughs> of the practice of Islam. But he is not a Muslim ruler in some sort of um, uh, divinely ordained sense. Now after 1500, this becomes uh, uh, challenged in Iran, and Iran under the Safavids has a government in which the ruler does claim to have divine uh, ordination. The Safavid family uh, makes a claim to represent uh, God's will or to be ruling on behalf of the person whom God will ultimately send to restore perfect rule on the face of the earth. But in Sunni areas, because that's a Shiite theory, in Sunni areas you don't have divine authority uh, dragged into uh, two debates. Uh, scholars may still do it, but in practical terms you have a much more um, let's say a more mundane uh, type of um, justification for rule. Uh, if you were doing this in comparative European terms you might uh, look at say the shift from uh, the Merovingian kings of the Franks who are divinely ordained as the rulers of this a community of Germans after the fall of the Roman Empire being replaced by Charlemagne who starts out basically as their chief, uh, chief butler who um, you know rises to power in his family uh, the Carolingians have no divine legitimation uh, in the way that their predecessors the Merovingians did. So we're moving away from religion as a central defining um, element of rule, at least religion in the divine right sense. So this is where Europe is moving in another direction. You know, the feudal Europe of many, many different uh, dukes and counts and so forth um, did not rely that much upon divine ordination. It was assumed that you had a Christian community and that ultimately Christians owed allegiance to the Pope. Uh, but the idea that a ruler was specifically designated by God as king by right. This is something that's, that arises later in European history, that would say after 1400, 1500, uh, whereas it is exactly what is diminishing uh, in the Muslim world. Um, in order to back this up, Uh, the Muslims who controlled the holy places uh, put increasing emphasis upon the pilgrimage. Anyone who's studied anything about Islam will know that there are five pillars of Islam, uh, you know, prayer, alms, fasting, a uh, declaration of God's uh, you know, oneness and Muhammad's role as his messenger, and the uh, performance of the pilgrimage. But prior to 1200, performance of the pilgrimage was a comparatively minor uh, part of a Muslim's religious obligations. A Muslim was supposed to perform the pilgrimage once during a lifetime if he or she was financially capable. But when you look at the city of Mecca, circa um, 1150 or so, it seems to only have maybe 5,000 year-round residents. It has virtually no water, and it doesn't grow any food. Uh, the sustenance of the city of Mecca depended in substantial part on the taxes or the tolls that were charged on the pilgrims. So it was expensive to make the pilgrimage. Uh, what we know of the, uh, of the toll that was charged at the time of that Saladin took over, uh, was that it was seven dinars, which is a very, very large sum, seven gold coins. Uh, but they needed the money to support the holy cities because there was virtually nothing there by the way of an infrastructural support. 
uh, Saladin canceled the tolls and took the supply of, uh, of food and water and uh, services for Mecca and Medina, took those as government obligations for uh, the government of Egypt and Syria. And they remain government obligations to this day. Uh, first under Saladin's descendants, then under the Turkish generals who took over uh, in, from his family in 1250, then under the Ottoman sultans who took over from the Turkish generals in 1517, and now under the, uh, the Saudi uh, royal family which seized power in the 1920s. Uh, and this is a very, very serious, uh, serious thing because it's not only providing for the pilgrims, but it also is a way of demonstrating to pilgrims uh, what there is at the center of Islam. In other words, Islam has this concept uh, called the Ummah. The Ummah is the Muslim community at any point in time as a worldwide entity. All Muslims are part of the Ummah. They may have divisions on different grounds, different sects, different theories, but they're all one. Uh, let's say um, the, the closest term you would get on the Christian side would be Christendom, but Christendom tends to imply, uh, imply political domination. It's where, where Christianity is dominant. Uh, but the Ummah has no implication of, uh, of anything other than simply uh, brothers and sisters within Islam. This idea, which is seemingly present uh, in the lifetime of Muhammad and seems to be part of documents that, uh, that go back to the preaching of Muhammad, uh, this concept is still uh, vital among Muslims today. And you, you, you compare Islam with other religions and you don't really find that. Is there a world Christian community? Well, not exactly in the way that they have. Or is there a world Buddhist community? Or a world uh, Hindu community? No, the divisions in all these other religions uh, are uh, significant enough that people don't normally refer to uh, everybody as belonging to the same community. But in Islam, they do claim they're part of the same community. The notion of the imam or the caliph was for the first 500 years or so, the touchstone of this notion of ummah. All Muslims who were educated knew that there was someone somewhere who was the leader of the Muslim community and who would be, um, uh, no, you, you, there's a place you could go to where you could find him, whether it was originally in Medina, in Arabia, or then in Damascus, or in Baghdad. There was someone who was the head of the ummah, and he could be called the caliph or the imam. Um, when the last caliph was killed in 1258 by the Mongols, and the caliph who was cranked up in Cairo uh, gains no traction as a focus of political uh, loyalty. And in fact, when the Ottomans take over in 1517, they simply dispense with that shadow caliph in Cairo. They have no need for him. Um, when the caliphate disappears, in my judgment, um, what happens is that the, the pilgrimage becomes the center of the Ummah. It's the place where Muslims come together. It's the place where they learn about one another, where they exchange views, where they see people of many different colors and languages that come from all parts of the Muslim world. It is the, the eloquent physical manifestation of Islam as a worldwide 
community. So it's very import important in this respect that the pilgrimage becomes vastly more important after the end of the caliphate than it was during the caliphate. And by more important, I mean more people go on the pilgrimage, which means that Mecca and Medina not only have to be larger, but they have to be able to support uh, more people in the pilgrimage season, which means they need more supplies, which means that whoever is supplying these desolate uh, desert uh, cities uh, has to be taking the responsibility to be the khadim, the guardian, the servitor of, of the holy places. So what we find is that in the uh, in the 1200s in particular, and 1300s, uh, you start to get schools being built in Mecca. You never had any uh, before 1200. Uh, these schools, medrases, uh, Islamic colleges, uh, teach people about Islam. And when you look at the life stories of Muslims from other parts of the world, uh, they go from Indonesia or from India or from Morocco or from Senegal to Mecca where they learn about Islam. They already are Muslims, they already know their local custom, but they go to the madrasas in Mecca and Medina and this is where they learn more and they stay for several years. Uh, in earlier times, you could not really overstay the pilgrimage because there's no food and water. You had to go home when the, when the rites were over. The rites only last a few days. But now you had people who were sojourning there for, uh, for several years. Not only did they go to school, but they would join Sufi brotherhoods. And the Sufi brotherhoods had uh, uh, residences in Mecca, Medina, uh, we know there are about 30 medrases and a similar number of Sufi uh, convents where you, could, where you could stay. When you look at the patronage of these institutions, uh, none of the patronage comes from, from Iraq, the old caliphal center. Uh, it comes from Yemen, it comes from India, it comes from Egypt, uh, from Syria, and from local uh, wealthy people, and wealthy people begin to think it would be a holy thing to facilitate the pilgrimage. So they sponsor public works and uh, uh, means for people to sojourn in the holy places. This also leads to a strategic uh, alignment of Egypt, Syria, and Yemen, because these control uh, the important avenues to Mecca and Medina. Uh, prior to uh, 1100, uh, Yemen really was an outlying area that nobody cared about very much. Uh, it was linked with Egypt, but that was under a Shiite uh, dynasty. Um, but now uh, Egypt, Syria, and Yemen become more closely linked, and then Sudan becomes uh, an important area. When the conquest of Islam had originally occurred, a truce had been reached on the, what is now the border between Egypt and Sudan. Uh, the conquest stopped, there was a treaty, and the Christians of Sudan uh, were not um, attacked by the Muslim armies in Egypt. Until now, when you start to have Sudan becoming strategically important, because it is uh, so close to Arabia across the Red Sea from the holy cities. So there's a, a great change in the weight of uh, this um, part of the Middle East from what it had been, say, in 900 or 1000. 900 or 1000, almost all of the weight of political and religious and cultural influence in the Islamic Middle East was in I Iraq and Iran. Now Iraq and Iran are sort of cut off and the weight shifts to uh, Egypt, uh, Syria, uh, Yemen, and to a lesser degree, uh, 
Sudan. One of the marks of this new valuation of the pilgrimage is that uh, people begin to, to add to their personal names the title Haji, which means someone who has made the pilgrimage. Uh, it can also be El Haj. Uh, People who made the pilgrimage before 1200 may have used the title Haji, but if they did, I have not found it. Um, even though I have specialized in reading Muslim biographical dictionaries and I've gone through literally tens of thousands of capsule biographies of Muslim scholars, many of whom it'll say, you know, he, he made the pilgrimage in such and such a year, but you never see the title Haji. After 1300, you have Hajis popping up all over the place, but particularly in outlying areas like Indonesia, uh, India, China, uh, West Africa. And when you look into the anthropology of the pilgrimage in these areas, you often find a profound change in status that a person acquires after they return from the pilgrimage. They can wear different clothes because they are haji. They can decorate their house, like their front door, in a different fashion because they are haji. They can be, or claim to be, um, uh, authorities on Islam because they are haji. And indeed, by the time you get to the 19th century, if you aren't haji, you probably don't count for a whole lot. Uh, interestingly, while the, um, the Hajis uh, for the Muslims are those who go to Mecca, Medina for the pilgrimage uh, at the end of every year, um, Christians pick up the practice and they start to call people who make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem Haji. So you have Greeks who will be Haji, but not because they went to Mecca, Medina, because they went to Jerusalem. And not with the Muslims, but more with the Christians, you have this becoming part of surnames. So you have Greeks who are named uh, Haji Athanasiu, or Harji, Haji Georgiou, or Haji Constantinou, or something like that. And it's not just the Greeks. Um, I'm told that this extends into the Balkans. Uh, and what it points to is not simply that Mecca and Medina become more important, but that for this part of the world, um, pilgrimage uh, takes on a, uh, a, a, much great, a much more profound meaning than it had earlier. Now, normally, when you lecture on pilgrimage in world history, you talk about pilgrimage leading up to the Crusades, that Christians made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, they found Jerusalem was held by the Saracens. They said, next year in Jerusalem, let's kill the Saracens. And then you have the Crusades. Um, but this is a, a later period of pilgrimage that doesn't have a parallel with the pilgrimages of medieval Christianity. So in Christianity, going to Rome, going to Constantinople, going to Jerusalem, going to uh, Santiago de Compostela in Spain, this is what medieval Christians did when they made a pilgrimage. Um, but now it is more the, the Muslim, uh, the Middle Eastern f form of pilgrimage that becomes, um, that becomes the dominant one. And the rulers uh, gain uh, credibility by uh, claiming that they are the, uh, the servitors of the holy pilgrimage cities. In Cairo, in uh, I think in the 1260s, back on frame for the camera, um, in Cairo, uh, I believe in the 1260s, there is a new custom that arises, which is that when the 
pilgrimage starts every year, it will be led by a, uh, a shrine, an empty room built on top of a camel. And the exterior of this shrine will be elaborately decorated with uh, cloth hangings and gugaws and so forth. And the, the camel with the empty room on top will lead the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, Medina. Uh, this practice in Cairo, uh, as I say, I believe in the 1260s, continues down to the 1920s. Every year you have the ceremonial camel. Uh, and once they started in Syria, then other people want to send their ceremonial camel. And then they'll want to compete over whose camel gets to go into Mecca first. And the governor of Mecca, usually knowing where he's getting his grain and his water from, always gives precedence to the Egyptians. But the ceremonial camel, nobody knows the origin of the practice. Um, but the ceremonial camel, is, before the caravan starts out, he's led around to all of the, to the palaces of all the major military commanders in Cairo uh, to sort of receive blessings and so forth and so on. So it, it becomes the physical symbol of the political uh, uh, authority that is sending out the, uh, the caravan. It doesn't go to the caliph to get authorization. It goes to the major, uh, the major generals. Some people have likened this ceremonial camel to uh, a practice that was observed in the 19th century that certain Arab tribes, when they would uh, travel or go to war, would carry a camel with an empty um, room on its back, a closed camel saddle. And they would liken that to the Ark of the Covenant that was carried around by the ancient Israelites. That the, 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 there was a sacredness to this, to this space that was moving uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the nomads, or with uh, in the nomads, or in this case, with the caravan. All right, uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, had a plausible claim to being the leading state in the Muslim world during this period because uh, they controlled uh, Mecca Medina. And at least in the early 1500s, they worked to ensure that the Europeans would not be able to interfere with the pilgrimage by moving ships up into the Red Sea. So the defense of the Red Sea and the, uh, and the, the Gulf of Oman, the southern approaches to, the, uh, uh, to Mecca Medina, became, uh, at least for a while, a very important part of, uh, of Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman political world. There's no indication that the Ottomans cared a fig for any of this prior to 1517 when they take over from the generals in, in, in Cairo. So basically they conquer the, uh, the military regime in Cairo uh, at that time and they immediately take on the same geopolitical uh, uh, strategic um, aims that the, that the Turkish generals had had before the Ottomans came. Uh, they are um, essentially expanding their mandate and clearly deriving uh, legitimacy from their new role because the Ottomans take over this title, Khadim al uh, There's a scholarly debate over whether they also take over the title Khalifa and call themselves Caliph. And there's some evidence that they do. But you can probably find 50 or 100 citations of them being called Khadim al-Haramayn to every occasional citation of them being called Khalifa. And the notion of the Ottoman ruler as a caliph does not gain any uh, real potency until the late 19th century, which I'll talk about in a later lecture. So it's really this role of protecting 
uh, Islam. That is, uh, that becomes the benchmark of uh, what a Muslim ruler is in this later period. Uh, I had not originally thought to lecture on this today, um, but I've been thinking about it a lot, a lot lately because I think that it is um, very substantially at the root of the Arab Spring. To jump ahead to a later chapter of the book, uh, one, for example, not yet written. Um, a year ago, there were uh, eight Arab monarchies. There were seven military officer states, and there were two anomalous Arab states, one in uh, Iraq under American occupation and the other in Lebanon um, with its own particular uh, you know, multi-ethnic, multi-confessional uh, 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 formation. Of those Arab states, uh, five of them have now either uh, lost their rulers or um, are on the verge of doing so. That is to say, uh, the ruler of Egypt, the ruler of Tunisia, the ruler of Libya, are out of power. The ruler of Yemen is out of power but doesn't seem to know it yet. And the ruler of Syria is, is more up in the air. Uh, that's five of the seven officer states. Uh, the other two, uh, Algeria and Sudan, are either immersed in or only recently uh, exiting uh, tremendous civil wars that have exhausted their populace. Uh, in the case of Algeria, you might say that the Arab Spring came in 1992 um, when, uh, when you had popular motions that were put down by the military regime. So none of the monarchies have fallen, and five of the officer regimes have either, have either fallen or are uh, uh, desperately at risk. <laughs> Um, why, that, why that difference? I'm also pointing out that, that the Bahrain had been uh, experiencing a lot of demonstrations, but Bahrain was guaranteed by uh, other Arab monarchies, particularly Saudi Arabia, uh, but also other Gulf sultanates or uh, emirates. Um, you'll notice that nobody came to the aid of the officer states. Now, you have a problem in Tunisia. Does Egypt say, oh, we will send troops to defend? No. Um, the, each, the monarchies are in it together. The officer regimes are in it separately. So um, what's the difference? There are different ways to look at it. One way is to say that all of the monarchies were established by imperialist powers or inclusion of imperialist powers. In some cases, uh, imperialist powers would literally decide who was going to be the, the emir. Uh, Abu Dhabi is a famous example because the emir of Abu Dhabi was a Sheikh Shahbut who had a small coterie of great admirers in the West. And Shahbut was installed by the British. And then they found that once oil was discovered and they started to export the oil, they would go to Shahbut and they say, well, now you need a seaport. He said, well, actually, to export the oil, you need a seaport. So you build a seaport. I'm not going to spend my money on a seaport. So I'd say, well, you know, um, when we visit you in the palace, we don't like to eat with our fingers. He said, well, you know, bring your own silver. I mean, he, he would not spend any money. And he insisted that his oil royalties be paid in the currency of Abu Dhabi, which was the Indian rupee coin. So he had, his bed was, under his bed, he had piles of coins. He had palaces with coins in them. He wouldn't spend any money. And he said, you know, the oil companies, 
They cannot export the oil unless they spend money. So why should they spend my money when they should spend their own money? And so then the British sent some, uh, some strong-arm people, and they put them on a plane and said, your brother is now the emir of Abu Dhabi. And uh, his brother, uh, Sheikh Zayed, um, um, you know, was a much more agreeable fellow, smiling all the time, uh, like Sheikh Boot, illiterate, but, you know, he let the oil companies and the British do what they wanted. So the imperialists set up the monarchies, but the military regimes were all revolutionary. They all defined themselves as Arab nationalist uh, vanguard uh, soldiers against imperialism. You know, we drive out the British and the French and their lackeys and we fight against Israel. This is what we do. We define our, our, we, our credibility as Arab nationalist leaders by defending the Muslim community against its enemies. This is exactly what the Turkish rulers, the Mamluks, had done back in the 13th century. They defined their ruler by protecting the Muslim community and fighting against crusaders and uh, Mongols. Now the definition is that they fight against uh, crusaders and Jews. By definition, I mean that is what Osama bin Laden said in his propaganda. He said, we must all get together to fight against the crusaders and the Jews because they are killing us off and our governments are not standing up for us. So what happened was that uh, these uh, nationalist regimes that had defined their legitimacy by, opponent, but by opposing imperialism, uh, whether it was British or French uh, or Russian or, um, uh, or Israeli or American, they define themselves by that. And then over the last few years, since 1991, and even more since 9-11, uh, they quit fighting imperialism. They became America's allies. They said, you know, if America says that Islamic radicalism is the great danger, we will suppress the Islamic radicals and we welcome American support. America wants to have predator aircraft that go and shoot rockets at people in our territory because they're anti-terrorist. We're anti-terrorist too. And if you want to send us your terrorist suspects, we'll, uh, we'll torture them. We'll get the truth out of them. We will do what America wants. And what America wanted was to uh, demonize radical Islamic activity, uh, at least that uh, portion of it deemed terrorist or potentially terrorist. Uh, and they wanted Iran to become the enemy of the Arab world. Uh, and they wanted the Arab world to feel friendly about Israel, uh, make peace, you know, form economic relations. And the regimes, by and large, these military officer regimes that had begun as anti-imperialist nationalists became, within you know, the last few years, became America's staunch allies defining the, uh, their function in the world according to an American vision of, uh, of the role of government, but abandoning their original legitimating claim that they were defending the Muslim community against imperialists and, uh, and Israel. Um, to me, the Arab Spring was a consequence of a profound crisis of legitimacy that did not affect the kingdoms, because the kingdoms had not, were not predicated on the idea that they would struggle against imperialism. They were all created by imperialism. And they weren't defined by how they're going to struggle against Israel, because by and large, they didn't struggle against Israel, although Jordan did from time to time. Um, so the kingdoms had never claimed 
to be anything than what they were. Uh, but these officer regimes uh, had made um, their, their right to rule uh, dependent upon their opposition to imperialism and to Israel and their populations, whether they had liked it or not, their populations had come to deeply um, interiorize that philosophy. So in other words, the Arab populace would say, we are the friends of the Palestinians. Uh, we are uh, opposed to American occupation of Iraq. That's imperialism. But the governments were now on the American side. And, and they fell. And it was interesting when the demonstrations began, most of the governments at threat announced Islamic radicals are trying to overthrow us. Whereas Islamic radicals were very hard to find in these demonstrations. But by saying that their threat was from Islamic radicals, they were essentially saying what the United States thought was the underlying situation, namely that America's allies were being threatened by the evil people who were Islamic radicals, uh, even though it was manifestly not the case. Um, but it was very similar to what happened during the Cold War when you would have a, a dictator who would be faced with a nationalist uprising and he would say, the communists are trying to overthrow my government. And the Americans, communists overthrowing your government, send in the Marines because we can't let the communists take over. And I do believe that the Egyptians, Phoenicians, and others thought that Europe and America would come to their aid to keep them in power in the same way that during the Cold War, um, we came to the aid of dictators who were threatened by international communism. Uh, it didn't happen. Um, ultimately, we'll have to find out why it didn't happen. Why did uh, the US let, its, let these people who claim to be its allies uh, go? But uh, it is the end of a form of Islamic rule that began in the 13th century or in the 12th century when you had uh, protection against outside invaders and maintenance of, uh, of a Islamic regime, uh, nominally an Islamic regime, uh, for the protection of the uh, ritual uh, observances of Muslim populations. Uh, that's when this philosophy came into being and it came to an end uh, last uh, spring. So you can go through the history of the Ottoman Empire and trace this, uh, which is actually where I intended to start today's lecture, uh, was to talk about what, what these military regimes are actually like and how they worked in terms of monopolizing power for the military. The situation we have now is that the military regimes have discarded their rulers, but the officers are still there and it will take uh, a generation or more to get the officers out of de facto, uh, de facto power. Um, it's something that we tend not to look at, but it's interesting to think of because the, the alternative was what you saw in Iran. In Iran, you had a Shiite regime that claim to be ruling on behalf of the Messiah who would return, the Mahdi, uh, and bring perfect justice. Uh, and the regimes, as they moved along from the 1500s down to, uh, down to the 20th century, became less and less credible as um, uh, as the forerunners of this messianic individual. So they lost their religious credibility and the, re and the revolution that came about uh, shifted the religious credibility onto a new 
revolutionary government. But the interesting thing is that in Iran, when the regime fell, every military officer of the rank of colonel or general either went into exile or was killed or was put into retirement. Uh, this despite the fact that a war was beginning with Iraq that would last for eight years. The entire high command of the Iranian military disappears because every colonel and general had been personally vetted by the Shah of Iran. So what you had in Iran was a revolution in which the entire regime falls. What you've had in the Arab Spring is a perturbation in a long history of military officer rule in which the, the top person is discarded, but the structure that put him on top remains. And my guess is that when we have new constitutions and electoral laws, we'll find that there are provisions for the military to retain uh, a lot of privileges. For example, check out and see whether parliament is allowed to review the military budget, um, whether parliament is allowed to, uh, to monitor or audit um, projects designed to build villas and provide privileges for military officers. Um, my guess is that you will have uh, loyal Democrats who cut deals with the generals, and the generals will still be around 30 years from now, whereas in Iran, all the generals are gone. But now we have a new set of generals who are trying to create the same mess that they have in the Arab world. Um, this was not the lecture I intended to give today, but it's what I've been uh, consumed with uh, lately because of uh, other speaking obligations I've had, but also because of the uh, particular juncture we're at with the first UN General Assembly meeting after the Arab Spring, and everyone wondering what, you know, what, what's happening. So I thought I would tell you what's happening. Thank you.